If you would like to get some insights about the changes my clients, my peers and also myself experienced during the last 14 months of the pandemic, of course, related to fraud, non-compliance and other fraudulent behaviors, this episode could be one for you and maybe also for your team. Good to have you here. Corporate integrity, fraud, non-compliance, and cybersecurity. Would you like to understand the root causes, detect threats, and take measurements to protect the most precious assets? As a leader, you need to be prepared and stay actionable in the event of an incident. Sonia Sternemann talks in her podcast, The Human Factor. Corporate integrity matters. To leaders and entrepreneurs who want to have impact, foster corporate integrity, and act as role models. As an international expert for corporate governance and integrity, entrepreneur, and independent board member, she knows the challenges. Let her inspire you. Welcome back to this new episode of the podcast, The Human Factor, Corporate Integrity Matters. You might be an integrity enthusiast, a business leader, a corporate integrity counsel, or on your way there. I'm your mentor when it comes to corporate integrity with impact, founder of Corporate Integrity Concepts and the Corporate Integrity Academy, with the vision to protect and secure assets, reputation and actionability, yours and the one of your organization. Why? Because corporate integrity matters more than ever before. And now let's talk about the experiences, how the fraud industry evolved over the last year in the pandemic. That's just one of the crises we could all face. And I'm sure the next one is also coming up. I'm pretty sure also you have earned a lot of new perspectives. And as you already know, I'm always happy to receive feedback through one or the other channels. If you are new to this podcast, you will receive some food for thought to bring back to your team. And for the ones joining regularly, thank you very, very much. It's just amazing to have you here again, and it means a lot to me and my team. We all know that the way we work changed dramatically over the last year and impacted most of us, if not all, of the industries. That means also the fraud industry was and is facing a huge evolvement. Therefore, I am convinced that all of us having a stake in the industry are impacted in one or the other way. These changes give us important insights on how to protect our assets. And that is what we strive for. As you might already have heard, the input and questions you directly brought up becomes part of one of the next episodes. The topic of today about how the fraud industry changed came up during the last weeks when it was when I was writing on my new book edition. I was asked by the publisher earlier this year whether it would be possible for me to work on the second edition of my book called The Human Factor, White Collar Crime, Non-Compliance and Cybercrime. After a few moments of doubt, yes, my first two quarters of the year were already fully booked and very, very busy, and I had no clue how to replan my entire schedule, but I found a solution and agreed, which means that May 2021 was dedicated to the new release. For me, it was and is very important to adapt. That skill set is one of the most supportive, no matter in what area of life. I often hear the excuses that life happened and therefore X, Y, Z was not possible. But to be honest, and we all know that, life always happens and that's great. Fraud also happens and the fraudsters are faster than we as the reactors to that area are. Therefore, we need a huge maturity level of adaptability in our fraud fighting industry. And that's what we have to ensure and protect. And also we have to empower our new generation to work on that. What I have experienced since May 2020 is supported by two studies, both published by the ACFE during the pandemic. The fraud cases increase on an overall level. That's also what the studies say, and that's what we experience. So the feedback and also the requests we have received from our client dramatically increased. 
and for all, still believing that it only affects the others, the likelihood of becoming a victim too increased again and will also increase. At the moment, I do not know whether a third edition is going to be published by the ACFE, but I would highly, highly appreciate it. And will my colleagues know about that need we all have here in this industry? The experience collected on a global level should be part of the next discussion on board, management and team level. Because it affects all of us. For boards, it is key to validate these facts with the actual strategy and allocation of resources because it always starts at the top. The management team will do good to check the priorities again and make sure that it, the cuts, if needed, are done on the right positions. But more about where that could or should happen in a few minutes. Before the first study of the ACFE was published, we received significantly more requests from the market. And there was a pattern. More than 70% of the cases were detected by TIPS. And that's, all, that's also good because we all know that the TIPS are the, are the core detection points when it comes to fraud. It was not an accident. It was not the internal or external auditor, nor was it the management reviews. No, internal and external whistleblowers raised their voice. And that is one of the positive effects I recognized over the last months in the crisis. Physical lockdown and isolation but an increased awareness from the ecosystem of the affected organization. That's what we have experienced. In all the cases, we saw how the stakeholders felt responsible. They felt responsible for our organizations. And they were responsible to speak up and support. Even the circumstances are burdening the organization as such. It is important to validate the ecosystem. I would like to focus on three aspects, how the fraud industry was and is affected by the pandemic. First, the fraud risk as such. Then, the anti-fraud programs. And third, the investigations. When it comes to fraud risks and to the question how the pandemic or the crisis affected the different risks of becoming a victim, there were the different areas to be taken up. One is, how was the risk landscape and risk management set up before? before we hit the crisis. And how did the landscape change? So far, because now we have already 14 months or even more when you listen to that podcast. And maybe if you listen to that podcast in two years, we have even more information how we came out of that. And the third one, where do we expect the journey to go? With having said that, if there is no existing risk mapping, the change cannot be measured. We then only talk about the gut feeling but have no evidence. So be careful about that. Therefore, that was already mentioned in the last episodes before, the risk identification process is key. What I have seen at my clients' cases is that not only the cases of social engineering in the territory of cyber increases, but also in the non-digital world. For example, bribery and corruption. On an overall basis, the risk of becoming a victim of social engineering increased significantly. And compared to the study from the ACFE, it is exactly what also my colleagues experience all over the world. The overall fraud level increased and will also increase within the next 12 months. That is what we all expect in our industry. So the expect expectation is made by the experts being out in the field and dealing with fraud cases, investigations, detection methods, and also pre the preventional part. We expect to have an additional increase. In addition to that, 50% of the participants already see that cyber fraud increased and the expectations go into exactly the same direction. No wonder. So cyber fraud will not remain the only fraud pattern. Identity theft, payment fraud, bankruptcy and unemployment fraud, and here we talk about the social insurance fraud, credit fraud, etc. Then the fraud by vendors and sellers as well as healthcare fraud, insurance fraud, loan and bank fraud. And not to forget our well-known evergreen bribery and corruption. 
will affect our organizations more in the future than ever in the past. So what does that mean to us? To us as the responsibles in our organizations, no matter what hierarchy level you are in, to us as investigators, because I know quite a few of our listeners, if not most of them are investigators or CPAs and dealing with all these cases or internal audit. I'm convinced if you are listening to this podcast, you have already a high maturity level of integrity. Important is that you are not the only lone enthusiast doing so in your organization. You will have much more power if corporate integrity is a strategic priority and not just a compliance task. And I know you are aware of that. Summarizing how the actual crisis and every crisis, so we can also think back to 2008, has impacted the fraud patterns we in our industry experienced and expect additional increases. With that knowledge, I would expect from the decision makers that actions and measurements are set up. But we will see. So coming to the next point about the anti-fraud programs, the normal process of preventing, detecting and responding to fraud does in real life not start with preventing in a way which could be called effective prevention. <laughs> we all know about that, especially if we would try um, we would try to convince someone that they have to include an anti-fraud program. No, it starts with responding as a victim. Most of the time, something needs to happen before we know better. With the evidence gained in the industry and published, we would know that the fraud cases increased and increased. Wouldn't we expect to have an increase in the anti-fraud program resources too? I definitely would. But listen, less than 15% will significantly increase their overall investment into the anti-fraud resources. And less than 30% will slightly increase the spending. With these two first areas, I would like to give you the food for thought of the take home or the take to the office assignment. The following two questions should challenge either your client's or your company's actual setup. So first question is, how does your risk landscape look like since the crisis started with regard to the above mentioned fraud risks of, I repeat it here again, because I know most of us are just listening to podcasts when they have nothing to write. So cyber fraud, identity fraud, identity theft, payment fraud, bankruptcy, unemployment fraud, Fraud by vendors or sellers, healthcare fraud, insurance fraud, loan and bank fraud, and the evergreen bribery and corruption. That's the first question. So coming to the second one is, how are the investments in our anti-fraud program reflect the answer of the first question? So having an answer on these two questions will give you a good understanding of what you can expect from the near future related to your fraud risk. Last but not least, I would like to share with you the challenges as an investigator. And what we have experienced, and I'm sure you also made exactly or more or less the same um, experience over the last months. It is not a secret that the work, not only in the fraud industry, changed. In some companies, dramatically. Also for the one which have to conduct investigations. During an investigation, we have several different phases, but there are quite a few where, in the past, physical meetings were required. Especially when you think about our global cases, which also need a certain amount of traveling. Our involved parties are often not at the same location. That's just given fact, and that's how we operate. Not the ones we have internally, nor the external ones. So no matter whether you are an internal investigator, internal audit, or whether you are an external consultant, an external investigator, or an external auditor. The coordination of the teams as well as the other involved parties changed and requires additional technique involved. In our cases, the data storage as such 
to conduct investigations was not an issue at all. As we have centralized servers, and we are used to do that also in the past. But one of the key challenges was that the direct exchange with the team was not possible as we were used to it. Normally, we have different teams working together in their own room to ensure that the knowledge can be shared, especially when we have intense ex external investigations we support. For example, also the regulator. Now, we had to set it up virtually. The same for our interview processes. Interviews are one of the key elements we conduct for our clients. And I'm sure you also do quite a lot of interviews, investigative interviews or other ones. With the new virtual setup, it was necessary to train all our team members as it needs additional skill sets to perform virtual interviews, especially virtual investigative interviews. Think about how you um, they dealt with that. Did you? Organize additional skills at trainings? Did you receive such trainings? But more on that and also more on interviews, interview trainings, especially in a virtual environment, will follow in a few next episodes, promised. Having said that all, we are not the only ones. More than 75% of the global peer group also replied that the work as such became more difficult or more challenging. I think it's not difficult as such, but requires adapted processes and new training of all involved parties in the team. Having said that, it also ne means we need more time to do so, because if we just put additional interview trainings on our um, agenda, we all know that we were already busy before. So it means that we need an ad ad additional effort from our side to make sure that we are up to speed again. And here we are again with the key success factor of adaption. We all have to adapt to what happens. And the, the, the faster we can do that, the more successful we are in our undertakings, in our investigations, and also how we can support our internal clients and external ones. For some people, changes are difficult, for others exciting. I don't know, on which side are you? on the difficult one or being excited about changes. The more adaptive we are, the more exciting it can be and vice versa. If we are not adaptive, it's going to be stressful. What I ask in our team, and maybe this is also a question which could be brought up in your environment, I'm not sure. What is your adaption maturity level? I use the scale from one to 10, 10 means I'm very adaptive. And with mentioning a number, also an example, not older than two years, was required. You can imagine that already the question itself made it possible to shift the perspective. And it was very interesting to see how people think about themselves, about their adapt adaption ability, and what kind of examples they brought up. Because without the example, the answer, I think, is not half as interesting as with the example. If someone tells you why the person thinks they are adaptive or they are not adaptive, it gives you great insight also for you, you as a leader and leading that team and that person. My personal conclusion of what changed in our industry during the crisis is quite simple. Everything and nothing. The why remains the same. Why we do it, why we support our clients in investigations, why do we support our clients in um, detecting fraud patterns and why are we always preaching about prevention is because we are convinced that corporate integrity matters. That's also the why, why we train people all over the world, not only um, our internal ones. And also what? The what remains the same. We still strive for the facts, strategically, professionally, and also in a respectful way. That's key for us. And it also doesn't change when we have a crisis, no matter what kind of um, crisis. It's our profession to strive for the facts, for the evidence. 
But the how we do that completely changed by reaching the next level. By being forced to do so, the toolkit broadens and the learning curve increased for all of us. We all had to go through that. And I'm so sure the next crisis is coming or the next incident is coming also harming our industry or impacting our industry. It's not that it harms us, but it impacts and affects us and we have to adapt. Our clients and also our team went through a valuable journey and I'm convinced your team, your clients and yourself too. And it's time to recognize that and also see what you have achieved during that time. You did a great job to adapt and to make sure that your why and your what can still be conducted in another way. And before I forget, do you remember the take home or the take to the, of to the office assignment? I just repeat it again, these two questions we had. How does our risk landscape look like since the pandemic started with regard to different fraud patterns like cyber fraud, identity theft, payment fraud, bankruptcy, unemployment fraud, fraud by vendors and sellers, healthcare fraud, insurance fraud, loan and bank fraud, and the evergreen bribery and corruption. The second question was, how are, are the investments in your anti-fraud program and also the training of your people reflect the answer of the first question above? But of course, and promised, you will also find the questions again in the show notes. This was the episode number 13 of The Human Factor. Corporate Integrity Matters. Following the belief, corporate integrity secures and empowers individuals and organizations. Would you like to learn more, meet peers and getting qualified? So visit the website Corporate Integrity Concepts or Corporate Integrity Academy. Or do you think this podcast could be interesting for someone you know? Sharing is caring and we are always happy to welcome your peers to our community. And if you like this episode, subscribe and don't miss any of the future ones. The show notes are, of course, enriched with relevant information and your connection via any of the social media channels is highly appreciated and will be answered. Promised. And please do not forget, topics of your interest or interview partners are highly welcome. Just send me a note on any of the channels you know. That's it from my side. I thank you for listening. My name is Sonja Stiernimon and I'm your host. Stay curious, actionable and a role model. Take care and goodbye.